Aloha kako and mahalo nui for joining us here on Lei Anue Nui. Um, on behalf of Hawaii Nui Akea, the School of Hawaiian Knowledge, as well as Kanayo Kana and all of our partners, we're really excited to have you all choose to join us today here on Zoom as well as on Facebook. Um, so we will get started here. And as always, and some of you have already been doing it, so thank you so much. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And I started to see that we have friends joining us from Vancouver, Washington, from Wailua, Kauai. Um, over on Facebook, I was mentioning earlier, we have friends saying aloha from Illinois, from Pennsylvania, Los Angeles, Arizona, Pasadena, California, Vermont, Alabama, Maryland, Orange County, California. Hey, I actually know Orange County because my auntie lives there um, in um, Fountain Valley. Uh, let's see, Kihei Maui, aloha. Tigar, I think it's Tigar. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but Oregon. Uh, let's see, Canada, Minnesota, Lodi, California, or Lodi, not sure. Austin, Texas, Port Angeles, Washington, Tucson, Arizona, Heia, Hawaii, Aurora from Texas, Massachusetts is joining us today, New York City, Menlo Park, California, Clovis, California. Um, oh, I'm looking back here on um, Zoom. We have Ohana from Lahaina, Waimanalo, Anahola, Mililani, Makiki, Ur Urbana, Ohio, Salida, California. Woohoo! We got people from all over, and I know more will be joining us. So. Maika Iloa and Mahalo Nui, also Missouri, is just tuning in. Maika I. So our first question for today is, can you let us know in the chat, do you have any relatives who have lived in Kalaupapa? Put a one if it's I, yes, and two for Aole, no. So let us know. Oh, okay, I see a few ones popping up here in our Zoom. You know, uh, many of us um, do have ohana that have lived in Kalaupapa, a few twos as well. Um, and I'm looking over at uh, my Facebook. Um, we're still having friends joining us from Decatur, Illinois, Michigan, Seattle, Washington, 88 degrees in Lawrence, Kansas. Ooh, the Yakama Nation from Washington State. Okay, over on Facebook, I'm seeing a lot of twos, um, so that they, they don't have any relatives. Um, and some say maybe, Kamaha'o is saying maybe, Anake Malia. I'm not too sure, and maybe I'll um, go talk story with mom and, you know, the ohana, because I, maybe I never asked that question before, um, or maybe have looked into it, and maybe today's presentation, um, not just for Kamaha'o, but for all of us, will help to spark those conversations. Um, I, I see a lot of twos there on our Facebook page. So yeah, we'll see how today, maybe I'll have to ask this question again at the end. And maybe, you know, as we go through this next hour together, you might, mom or grandma or grandpa or auntie that's there with you might say, hey, I think Maybe we do have Ohana there. So I'm gonna, um, as we do our Ho'olauna, I'm gonna stop sharing now. And I, um, I wanted to say aloha. I'm Malia Nobriga Oliveira, and I'm tuning in from Hanapepe, Kauai. My oneha now, and I'm tuning in on behalf of Hawaii Nui Akea at the School of Hawaiian Knowledge. Um, and our school in, uh, involves the, Center for Hawaiian Studies, known as Kamakakua Kalani, the Center for Hawaiian Language, Kawaihue Lani, our Kapapalo'i Okanewai, our Cultural Garden, our Lo'i, um, and then our fourth unit is Native Hawaiian Student Services. And I'm also excited because 
um, as a part of Kanayo Kana. Um, one of our um, Komike Ho'okele members is also joining us today. And she has, like many of us, we have so many papale. You know, so it's like, which papale are we wearing today? <laughs> so I'm going to ask to unmute on her end and come and give us a ho'olauna, Miki. Aloha. Veli na mai kako. Kalehulehu wauna o Miki ala he puaha aheo kalei lana kilo ke kukui o lani kaula. No Molokai, Molokai Nuya Hina, Molokai Kapuleo, O Molokai Aina Momona, Ua Mili Ia E Kamakani Puroe, Ika Aina Mauma Uo Hoolehua, Ia Novao. Ho Hoa, Ike Yala, Belina. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, Maika Iloa. Yep, welcome. Aloha from, I hail from Molokai, um, the little island in the middle. Uh, Born and raised there, uh, my family is from Molokai for many generations. And currently I serve as the Chief of Interpretation, Education and Volunteers for Kalau Papa National Historical Park. My kai. So I know you have some beautiful slides and mo'olelo for us. So maybe <laughs> let's just jump right into it. Okay, my kai. Let's go with a uh, share screen. Okay. And maybe as you're getting that all set up, I'm going to ask another question really quickly. Can you put a one in the chat if you've ever visited Kalau Papa? Like actually gone down. Maybe you walked down. I did do a walk down. Um, and that was an experience. And then I said, I would catch the plane back up. <laughs> but oh, okay, cool. I see a lot of ones in there. People have visited. Um, my kai. Oh, and some said one live down there. <clears throat> oh, my kai. Awesome. So aloha kako. Oh, great, great, great. And we do see some that are saying, "Yep, I visited Kalau Papa," and some say, "Nope, I haven't been there." But you get chance. Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> it might be a while, but you get chance. All, All right, right, let's jump into it. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to spend this quarantine time uh, in Kalau Papa, and so it's given us a chance as a community to reflect a lot on the parallels between our kupuna's experience um, facing Hansen's disease or Maipake, Maiho Ka'avale, and this COVID-19, and see the dynamic that's happening in our communities and our families and in our nation really has um, sparked a lot of conversation and looking back at how our kupuna faced some of these challenges and how they came up with creative ways to um, survive basically survive and so if they can do it i believe every single one of us can do it too uh, so let's kind of get a little bit into the history because maybe you're not familiar and i wish that we would teach this in school more prominently because I think there's so many great parallels in Ha'avina in this part of our history. So what is Hansen's disease? Why do we call it that? What is the difference between leprosy, Hansen's disease, and ma'ipake? Um, basically, this disease has been around since biblical times. It is something that has spread across every continent and it's, it's moved around the world slowly. And What's kind of neat about it is it's caused by a bacteria. And this is the first human pathogen that is identified under the microscope by this doctor. He's Norwegian, Dr. Armar Hansen. And so it's named after him. This bacteria, they could see it on a micro, under the microscope. Um, and so at first, when we're talking about how it spread, you know, the, basically we're just going to make observations, right? So this is like hundreds of years ago. People are trying to figure out how does this thing move? And so in the 1800s, uh, we think that it is hereditary because we're noticing that it's moving through family clusters. But then we, then we kind of evolve our thought and we think that it's spread from skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact over an extended period of time. Today, we believe that this is actually spread through um respiratory droplets mm -hmm. so same thing coughing and sneezing just like another really famous 
<laughs> sickness going around is spread the same way. And so it kind of makes sense because, um, yeah, the way we live as Ohana in Kauhale and our, our circles of, of interaction. But the big difference for this bacteria is that it has a really, really long incubation period, anywhere from nine months to 20 years. So you could have this bacteria for 20 years and not show any signs of having this disease. So imagine that. And imagine how many people you could be spreading that to. So some of the symptoms, right, that we can kind of tell, because back then they didn't have any testing, right? You just kind of went on a visual. And um, so sometimes they'd see lesions and discolorations on the skin. Um, you, it affects your nerves and what we call neuropathy. Um, so you lose sensations. And so things like heat or cold, yeah, temperature, um, pain, if you've got you know, poked with something sharp, you wouldn't feel it, which then, you know, actually gets really dangerous because if you step on something sharp or you, you know, put your hand on some, a, a, a flame, you wouldn't even know, you couldn't tell, you didn't have those signals coming to you to tell you that, oh, pilikia. And mm -hmm. so sometimes those wounds would go un unnoticed and then secondary infections would occur. But other things like muscle weakness, paralysis, you know, you've got um, reabsorption, so like cartilage or certain um, parts of where your body just sort of reabsorbs back into itself. And so some of these complications um, would develop over time, so leading to things like blindness and eventually, you know, cannot walk, cannot hold things, cannot do things, and cannot take care of yourself. And this is really interesting because for some reason, Hawaiians were disproportionately affected by this disease. 95% of the world's population is naturally, naturally immune to this bacteria. So why was it that we were getting sick more often than everybody else and at a really alarming rate? So other diseases, if we kind of give a landscape of that era in 1800s, I have a list of some of the other things that were going on. And if you notice, some of them are slow transmission and slow developing, and others were really rapid and was wiping out people in waves. And so, you know, everybody's trying to figure out the characteristics of this disease. How do we address it? How do we keep people safe? And how do we treat it? Right? So today, we're actually seeing this whole process happen on a global scale, right? And seeing all these different countries trying to tackle the same problem using different methods, which I think is really interesting. Okay, so what did, what did we decide to do? Um, King Kamehameha V, uh, Lot Kapuaiva, he spent a lot of time on Molokai. He loved visiting and he knew the generosity of the people and he knew the resources and abundance of this aina. And I think it's really important to note that <clears throat> In 1848, yeah, up until 1848, the Akua owned all the land. And then in 1848, we said, Kanaka, you can own land. So everybody's like, okay, my family been here a long time, but now a young palo palo that say, I can stay here forever and ever. Right on. Yeah, they believe in the mana of that pepper. And then in 1865, here comes this, this act to prevent the spread of leprosy. And this law is going to change the way people, maybe kind of waver some of their, their faith in the pepa, in the pala pala, because um, in this law, there are four things that are addressed. And one of them is setting aside land specifically to isolate and protect uh, the rest of the society from those who are infected. And that's how we're going to stop the spread is isolation quarantine. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, sounds familiar, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, he empowers the... Um, the police and the Board of Health to use force when necessary and basically criminalizes being sick. Yeah, it's, it's now a crime to be infected. And we can use force to remove you and in order to keep the rest of the public safe. Um, and so when he's looking for a place, like where, where we're gonna put all these people, right? Um, he chooses Kalaupapa Peninsula. And if you look at this picture, you can see there's water on three sides of the peninsula. And at the back, there's a 2,000 foot cliff. So um, that ocean is on the North Shore. 
it's very picky picky oh it's uh, very treacherous at times um very deep and so um and you're incapacitated it's very difficult to just swim off the island and it's hard for boats to come and just pick up their friends and dig out so um and then you have this you know very prominent mountain to scale so they decided that given the water so yeah what does it take to sustain a community right there's a, a number of resources right so we need water that's guaranteed right and then we need some food and you know some some la'au you know there's things that were readily present on the peninsula just enough because they had by that time i think they had a list of like 112 names or something they had you know an idea of okay this is how many people we will find and let's put them there but what they had to do was basically kick out all the people who were already living there and so they confiscated lands they offered them compensation in various ways or you know land swaps but basically the ohana that had been living there for generations now had to choose whether their connection to that kulaivi was so strong that even if get one disease, you know, all these people coming in, were they going to stay there? Were they going to um, at kuleana and maintain that kuleana to their aina? Or were they going to protect their families from this unknown disease? Yeah, because really, again, at the time, they didn't know any much about it. There was no cure. And so they, some people left, some people stayed. They started to send people in. So the first boat arrives in 1866. Um, and the first 12 patients that come, they're a little older um, and they're the more severe cases. So there's a hospital built on Oahu to, as the receiving station where you're evaluated. And it's pretty, it's pretty appalling, um, the method that they employed. If you can imagine, if you were suspected of being sick, you were taken in you were stripped of your clothes and you were put on a pedestal and these doctors would walk around and examine you and they would cut pieces of you to look at under the microscope. So they would usually nick like the ear or, you know, like the shoulder or different parts that, you know, look suspicious. And because you could identify it under the microscope, um, that was basically your verdict. And so if you were found guilty, you would be um, taken into custody. And that transition um, varied throughout the years. Um, it progressively got better, but you can imagine um, the confusion that our, our ohana at the time felt, trying to determine why are the people who have this sickness treated different than others. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to jump in real quick. Yeah. I, you know, because it, it's sparking a lot of memories for myself. Um, when I was a haumana at Manoa, um, I, I participated in Halau Hanakeaka's Hanakeaka, that uh, one of the first ones that the Ohana Baker worked on was Kalua. Yes, P.E. Lani. <laughs> but, you know, and that was my method of <clears throat> learning more about all of this history because, like you said, we wish that these things were shared in our schools. And maybe there are some kumu out there and maybe this will spark some interest to share more, you know, but yeah, I mean, even growing up here in Kauai, we didn't hear the story of Pi'ilani and Ko'olau and Kalei Manu, their keiki. But it was through that Hanakiaka process that I, yeah, the Mo'olelo became real for me because it was Ohana, that are still living here that are related and ohana to them um in kekaha that you know that that whole that whole um event and all the events that led up to eventually you know ending where now pi'ilani had to end up burying um her husband and her keiki while they went up into kalalao but yeah, it's sparking a lot of, it's good memories because it was a really good time for me. That is a really powerful story. And, you know, over time, 8,000 patients, 8,000 people were sent to Kalau Papa. And you think of our population at the time, you know, right at the 1800s going to 19, lucky if we had 70,000 Hawaiians. So that is a huge chunk of our 
community of our Lahui being sent away. Um, and mahalo for bringing that mo'olelo up because I'm going to kind of connect it to this next day. Like, what do we call this disease? Why do we call it that? So ma'ilapela, right? Because that term leprosy comes from other parts of the world. Um, and so we kind of just, you know, um, made it sound, sound alike. Um, but it's also given a nickname of ma'ialii. Um, one of the first chiefs to contract the disease is Chief Naya, and that's Queen Emma's father. And I think he's suspected to have caught it from a one of his cooks or something, someone in his household, a servant. And um, they were noticing that because our ali'i traveled, um, they were being exposed on their trips. And so there's kind of a connection there. And then this term ma'ipake, uh, pake meaning Chinese. And so, you know, they saw a number of cases coming in uh, from immigrants in China, but really it's, it starts to establish itself here and there in little pockets in the Hawaiian community. And that's when people start to take notice. And it's not till they're sent to, uh, to Kalaupapa that they're, it, get, it's given this nickname, Ma'i Ho'oka'avale, or the separating sickness, because it started to not just physically separate people from uh, the rest, you know, in isolation and the rest of the world, you know, but really, it was about the splitting of the families of the Ohana. And I'm gonna share a little quick mo'olelo about on Molokai. So, you know, people try to figure out, we're always trying to figure out who brought it and who gave it to us. Yeah. How did I get sick, you know? And so we have some suspects, you know, right here on this <laughs> list here. Um, but we have an old mo'olelo on Molokai about uh, this strange flesh eating disease that starts to cripple the people and, um, they tried all their la'o and nothing works. And this healer, she has um, a gift of vision. And her name is Ku'una. And Ku'una dreams of Mo'omomi spitting out yellow pebbles in his cave. And so she dives in the water and collects them and uh, applies into the poultice and actually treats this disease. And it's something that brings her claim to fame. And if you want to know more about her, she's really interesting. She's got she left behind some other prophecies and, you know, very prominent uh, part of Molokai history. But hang on to that. She goes into the cave and she finds little yellow pebbles um, and works that into the la'au. Mm. So how is Kalaupapa described? No, so, there are lots of lots of references to the beauty and the ma majesty of the mountains and the ocean, the smells, the winds. Um, we have tons of wind names. Uh, just birds, a lot of birds who live on the sea cliffs, the plants that grow nowhere else in the world, and all of those are often referenced. Um, but in capturing this story, people start to come into Kalaupapa and they're bringing um, their own experience and writing about them. So there are a lot of mele, a lot of kaniko, that start to refer back to uh, Kalaupapa as being this or that. And so you can see the sentiment people had. And so, so some of them were very beautiful. And some of them sounded a little like this, a little dark. Kalua kupa pa'ue kanuolaia. Kanuolaia. Aina o ka eha eha. Aina ho ka avale. You know, just the, the despair and the grief that this image of Kalaupapa evokes in them. And then other times they had these really beautiful references. So think about maybe your Aina. And what are some poetic names for your Aina? And this is something, especially if you're tuning in with your Ohana, with your Keiki, you know, malama this one, malama these questions, and you can go back and have discussions afterwards about what is it um, that you think about when you see the Pali, Ko'olau, or your own mountains, or even this one that is featured here. This is Pane e Ne'e, and this is a picture of the trail that comes down. So I showed you how the peninsula sticks out in the water. Everything was brought in by boat, and eventually we had an original trail, and then this is the trail that we use today, um, uh, uh, Kupale Trail. Um, and you can kind of see it kind of carved into the, the cliff there. But what are some poetic names maybe for your aina? Um, and why is it important for us to remember them and use them and bring life to those names? A lot of times our, our features were named after um, some prominent characteristic, something that stood out. We didn't get, I mean, really, it's, yeah, 
we describe the water, we describe the, the, the way the landscape look, you know, the rock, you know, big rock, small rock. You know, like, I mean, it's kind of, it's simple. We didn't have to get complicated and very rarely are they named after people. It's usually form and function, yeah, with our place names. Um, but then, I don't know if you noticed, like a lot of the Western naming, they, they like name it after people, like this my spot, this my spot, so-and-so was here. And they like, the, they want the place to remember the name because they happen to be there. Not recognizing that, mm, had a couple hundred people there at least before you, right? So just something to think about. Actually, okay. I have a question that's coming up on Zoom and um, mm -hmm. they're asking if, um, what was the name of the woman who had the vision of the yellow stones? Her name is Kuuna. Okay. Kuuna. Kuuna. And if you, I'm not sure you can find it online, but she's connected to something called Kalaina Vavai. She makes a, a carving of her prophecy of the coming of Westerners and she carves boot prints into the sandstone. Um, but I see the mo'olelo for later. You, you can't contact me, I'll tell you the mo'olelo because I think it's really good. Okay. Hiki no? I, um, so if you can imagine you being sent someplace, have you ever taken a trip and you forget something? And you go, oh man. So then you run out to the store, right? You're going to stop at the airport or whatever and you're going to grab what you need. Um, that was not the case. So I think today we have access to so much information, right? We have our smartphones, computer, radio, TV, newspaper, all these things telling us um, that we can plan ahead. And to back then, that wasn't, that wasn't how it happened, right? It was very, very blind the way they were moving into this space. So you get plenty of stories. I just wanted to pick out two things. Um, so the first story is this quote right here. The very first patients are asking for um, the Board of Health for things. And if you can think of what would you ask for, like you get someplace brand new, you got to start a whole new life, you know, what would you ask for if you were just provided the most basic of necessities? The kupuna asked for buckets to carry water so they didn't have to go so far to every time, you know. And we think of like just something as simple as running water. When you're sick, how easy it is to go to our bathroom and have a hot shower and wash our face and drink water, you know, and be comforted by water, right? They had to go all the way to the stream. And so that was a complication in itself. So they're asking for buckets. They're asking for bandages and, you know, things to help take care of themselves. And the last thing is a newspaper. Of all things, hmm. Okupuna wanted newspaper. Why? Because they wanted to know what was going on in the rest of the Pai Aina. Really, really important. So if you look at this time already, right? This is, we're going into the Kalakawa era. We're going into the Lili'u era, right? There is a lot of transition politically. And so these families, you know, these people are coming up. They want to know where things stand. They want to know what's going on. They want to be informed how privileged we are that we have these things, right? That we can just get information like that. Imagine sitting and waiting every week for the ship to come with news. Oh, imagine them sitting there and praying for those things, yeah? So anyways, just reflecting on how Pailani may be and, you know, <laughs> blessed, blessed, how poor my cut you we are today to have the things that we have. Yeah, um, the second know, that, that made me, I'm sorry to interrupt, um, it made me remember some of my times that I went with um, our friends down to Miloli'i. And, you know, we would be hosted by the Kaupikos and the Kaupu Ohana. And, you know, it was funny because when we would stay with one of the Ohana, because they do a lot of water catchment there. And so there was a sign when you would go to use the, use the lua. It says, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Flush it down. <laughs> that also told you that if you needed to flush it, you got to make sure you're going to replenish the water. Yes, and yes. Also get the bucket, bring them yes. inside. You know, I mean, so it's, it's funny, but I mean, it really made you think about it, you know? And then yes. you like, oh, oh, uncle would say, um, okay, baby, you only get two buckets of water to oh, oh. You know, if you're going to wash your hair, you better think about that, you know? But 
Yeah. It really helped me to think about like how much water to be exactly to be mindful of resources, right? Because today we just turn on the water and it's like endless. Yeah. You never ever just have the pipe go dry these days, right? right. The electricity just comes through the wire and we don't really think about what it takes to provide those things for us. So, you know, that disconnect, I think, um, this, anyways, this is when these mo'olelo help us to really appreciate what we do have. The second star I want to mention is actually one, um, a, a, a quote that is shared by Peter Ka'il, and he was cousin to Queen Emma. And he, I get, he was an ali'i, and he contracted the disease and was sent to Kalau Papa. And he shares in one of his letters that a man died in his arms, and his last words to him were, Ivahi yeah. I was just every time I see that term, it just strikes me because he died of starvation. And when you think about what is important and necessity uh, necessary for us as Kanaka, um, our I, our relationship to Haloa, our Kalo, they were sending in rations of crackers and salted pork and flour and coffee and sugar. But our people wanted to eat kalo. And they said, if I just had just a little bit of poi, I would be fine. And so, you know, you, if you look at the, the, the part of the rations, they were allowed eventually um, 21 pounds per person per week. That was their allotment. And you think about it, that's one pound per meal. <laughs> That's the rate that that's the average rate of consumption for one kanaka is 21 pounds a week. Well, you know, and then you multiply that by how many people were there. And then so anyways, it goes into supply and how do we get kalo and, and pa'i'ai, you know, poi to the settlement. Um, and so do you have these people who are um, severely compromised and they're trying to provide for themselves and you know, normally they would be at home in their families. And I don't know about you guys. I grew up on Molo, born and raised Molokai to this day. My, my mother-in-law is pure Hawaiian. She eats ai and ia every day. We do not fish. But she eats ai and ia every day because all the, ki- all the young men, or all the men who live on our street, when they get and they pass, they bring for her. The nephews, they bring for her. We take care of our kupuna. We make sure that that's what keeps them alive is eating what they what the kino know, and so you know as a form of okay we don't have a cure but can we at least be fueling our our immune systems and help us to fight it off like maybe we don't need lao maybe we just gotta be poikaika right and so you see kind of like how Hawaiian culturally we address things or look at solving situations and then how Western um, I guess answers or you know how their ideas of how to improve the situation never really line up and so um i want to mention this word kokua kokua what does it mean and you know i just pulled this out of the dictionary but really kokua is helping supporting advocating um really um being there and so in regular situations right the sick and afflicted the elderly they're Cared, cared for in their ohana. Um, and then now we're taking them away and we put all of them together. Well, who's taking care of them, you know, and who's going to make them feel better? Who's going to comfort them and pule with them and, you know, just aloha them. And so they eventually allow um, this official status of kokua, people who were not sick that could come and help the patients. So let's take a look and sort of ponder a little bit what happens to the ohana during this time. Um, you see here, I, I put patient, pictures of, of keiki. We managed as, I mean, when I say we, I mean the king, the government, you know, and the board of health, because in that transition from kingdom into something else, you know, into we, anyways, those ideas start to shift. Imagine in your ohana if the youngest person, or maybe the oldest person, or maybe yourself, imagine that you were convicted and sent away. How would you feel? And this is where that story of Kaluai Ko'olau, you know, is a good example of 
when do you think of the greater good of the lahui? Um, when it, do you think of yourself? When do you think of your keiki or your ohana? Like priorities, um, you know, and the ethics, the ethical questions behind that. And, you know, what is pono? And, you know, everybody will come up with a different answer. And all the answers are correct. Because nobody can judge in this case, you know, like whose pono outranks or outweighs the next person and what is important to them and what they're willing to sacrifice. Um, but I will say that some people came willingly and some people resisted. And it was, a, it is still a tragedy to me anyways that we had to criminalize to the extent that we did. Mm. Um, and think about it, like what happens to a person when your pico is severed? So there are people who, um, when they were sent, they were disowned by their families because of the, mostly because of the biblical context that if you had this disease, you were a sinner, you know, God is turning his back on you, you were an outcast, you know, there's all these, and then because people were afraid of the disease, you know, you were shunned and, um, and even the reputation of the whole ohana would go down the drain basically. So sometimes they had to disassociate and moka pico truly and so we have people that were brought to kalaupapa who changed their names to protect their family protect the integrity maybe um they owned a business and if people knew that one of them you know had the disease then nobody would you know um come and do business with them you know like when would you come eat their food or buy you know groceries from them or whatever their service was and so you know in order to save the rest of them they made those sacrifices of giving up their identity their inoa and their connection um, what happens when you take people away from their kulaivi um, there is a, a, a writing a, 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 I guess a letter written by one of the patients who says I am not of Kalaupapa I'm from Iloli'i I was a good person I never stole I fed my family, I worked hard, and I was honest. I'm a good person. I am from Miloli. I am not a leper. I will never be a leper. I would die a Kanaka. And the patience for being patient and having this um, particular experience that connects them. But really, what about what about the, their connection to their ohana at home, to their onehanao, to their kayaulu? You know, how do we reinforce that? Anyways, so you have the ohana and you start taking, up, taking people, right, one by one. Kupuna, keiki, um, the one who worked and earned, you know, brought food to the table, you know, all these different. What happens to the structure of the ohana? How do we our identities change. Um, I'm sorry, I had a question because it's, uh, I saw it earlier on Facebook, um, that one picture where the um, people are crossing their hands in the front. Yes. Uh, the question says, do you know the significance of the hands over the heart in the older pictures? This is shown in the pictures I have of my great grandmother along with her family and other patients. So this is their intake photo. And they, they take it like that so that because a lot of times the disease would present on their hands. And so they could track. It's almost like um, taking a snapshot of what they look like on that date. And then they could update that photo and see the progression of the disease on their face and then on their hands. Mm. Yeah. So this is their, this is their mugshot, basically. Yeah. Um, so moving into the, this next section, I guess. Um, right around, and I'm going to say the, the policy and how it plays into politics. Um, when you look at the numbers, there is a spike of people being sent to Kalaupapa right before the overthrow and right before the annexation. And it's a profound, 1,100 of the 8,000 people were sent in this little window, like this five six year window um and that's really like to me that's really significant because there are cases i mean people were 
miss uh what is that um like they were acute falsely accused so they get there and they realize oh never mind you're not sick but by the time like they're there and then they hold them and then they contract the disease or they became ill or <clears throat> they never got out and so some people were paroled and let go you know after being evaluated and some people didn't and so there's a somebody go investigate and go find out like just how significant of a contribution this is when you think about it like what is the building block of the lahui and of the aupuni it's the ohana like leadership starts at home and so when you start taking out the kupuna yeah now everybody else <clears throat> they don't know who to turn to they don't know who to listen to advice and direction like what we're going to do who do we listen to like you listen to all the politics today and just these really really big social issues facing us our conversations turn to the people we trust yeah see how we feel we 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 reverberate our own manao and our own our emotions and, and we come to some conclusions of what is that you know our truth and the social truth and now we pretty much just like they they really dismantled the ohana and i think that contributed to the success of the the overthrow attempt so what makes us strong and you know look at us today so this is another great how you could do with your with your keiki you know like what contributes to health we kind of got the physical health um identified be you know social distancing stay home no go out you know just limiting contact face mask you know wash your hands things like that but then what else what else keeps us healthy mentally emotionally and here's just some of the things and if we had more time i would get into like some of the really cool ideas um but culture super important beyond hawaiians we had lots of filipino chinese japanese um, communities coming in and so they clustered and they stayed together and wanted to continue their holidays and their pule and their you know traditions that reminded them who they are so that they not just that number they not just that that's not their identity yeah the one that you see in the mugshot they not just the name on the patient roster they wanted to remember who they were born and raised as and keep those connections and remind each other about that and so religion um you know sports they you know brought in all kinds started all kinds of teams they you know would do play music they had a band um built race track, you know just all kinds of things to bring the outside world in with them and instead of just waiting to die they want to get on with living and so you know continue to be self-reliant starting businesses you know um bringing their skills feeling just feeling useful um so a lot of us we struggle with that yeah in our in our stay-at-home orders like um if you know can go to work if you can't go to work like what am i doing you know trying to be productive and feel like you can contribute somehow um at first it's like yeah it's a vacation i just gonna hang out and then you know we click we click you get bored and so um working on all those things um helping to keep us connected and then communication so writing letters um letting people know how they feel trying to communicate and give and gather information i was gonna just do a quick comment you know like um relating it to today and how you know, like with say, say with graduations, right? I actually have been loving seeing how innovative the different schools are, are in celebrating and continuing these traditions. And some of, you know, with our friends, we've been having these conversations like that so many people actually love it. They, they like that it's very efficient. You know, it's um, cost effective. We're yeah. not like sitting there, you have to go rent chairs, you have to go rent uh, the Neil Blaisdell Center, or, you know, not everybody yeah. has a gym or something. Absolutely. And, you know, as people are creative, um, but there's also trade offs, you know, here and there. And so there's some traditions that you want to keep. And then, you know, there's, but there's room for new ones. And so that's a really great point because over the 103 years of this law being implemented, you know, we, really evolve with the times and so they're able to get really yeah really creative in keeping their spirits up mm. and you know in the early um 1940s um a cure is found and um it's a multi-drug therapy but really the key ingredient 
to fighting this bacteria are cell phone drugs. So if you remember that mo'olelo I shared earlier about ku'una, what is it that she goes and gets? Those little yellow pebbles. So in our mo'olelo, yeah, we talk about mo'o um, in caves, but mo'o sometimes are like natural phenomena that we can't explain. And so this probably was a fissure of some sort. At some point, that was a lava tube and the yellow stones is sulfur. I am pretty, pretty sure that we figured out the cure for this disease long before anybody else. So I will claim that uh -huh. uh, Moloka, on behalf of Molokaiians that we didn't actually figure out the cure and we fought this disease uh, once before in the past. Um, but anyways, that's just a really neat um, observation. So when we listen to Mo'olelo, sometimes it's not so literal what we're reading or hearing, but if we can kind of stretch our imaginations, our kupuna were using whatever words that they had available to describe something they've never encountered before. And so sometimes, yeah, like, uh, we just got to like lom yum a little bit and we go, oh my gosh, they already knew certain things. So anyways, in the 40s, uh, cure is identified and administered and we start to reverse. And so this is a, a picture, a side by side of the same person um, post-treatment. So some things we could change and some things we couldn't. So any bone loss, you know, any nerve damage, the um, blindness, things like that, we really cannot do, couldn't do anything about. Um, but definitely some of the swelling and things could go down. Um, where are we today? Um, and I got to pick it up, man. Okay, so um, in 1969, the law of separation is repealed. Um, and so the patient, basically, that's our, our Independence Day. June 30th, they officially, officially overturned that law. But for some time before that, they were already paroling and letting people out because they were already healed. Um, and... But you know what, when you, in Kalaupapa, it is, it can be really amazing. It's a beautiful place and it has so much mana and aloha. And they stepped out of the world, out of Kalaupapa into the world and said, eh, I gotta go back. <laughs> and when you think about the way we treat people just by their looks, a lot of times people can be really mean on the things they say. And today we are seeing that you know, so vividly in our current situation, um, just the writing and the protesting that, but that's our reaction to how people um, treat people just based on their looks or the color of their skin or, you know, something that's beyond their control. And so our kupuna felt some of that prejudice and retreated to the safety of Kalaupapa. So, um, they, so the Board of Health continues to be the administration so the whole peninsula from that cliff all the way out to the plains is its own county. We're separate from Molokai. So Molokai is part of Maui County and we are in Kalawao County. And uh, our mayor is the director of the Department of Health and who's really busy taking care of other things these days. Um, but as time went on, the patients were getting worried about, and oh, let me just say that it, the law is repealed in 1969, not because the government thought, okay, it's time, but because the patients had it's in the middle of the civil rights movement. They're like, eh, no, we're not even sick anymore. How come you guys making us stay over here? It's not fair. And so they start to campaign. And it's actually an article in a magazine that sort of exposes all of this, um, <clears throat> what the patients were waiting for, and brought some light onto the situation that then moved the politics along. Mm -hmm. And anyway, um, in 1980, um, the Kalaupapa National Historical Park is established. And that was by um, the, the patients evaluated all the different choices they had as far as an entity to curate this mo'olelo of theirs, of the kupuna who were there before them, and um, of the aina, of the plants and animals, and all the features, you know, the vai, the makani, everything. Who could best take care of this without um, interest in commercial development or, you know, the exploitation of this story? And they just didn't want this to, place to change very much and they wanted it to be preserved. And so they invited the National Park Service to come in. And, you know, I'm proud to say that we have a staff of almost 40 people and we are 70% Hawaiian. Um, I think that's a significant fact is that we are more than half Hawaiian employed um, because the lands belong to DHHL. 
um, where the settlement is and the rest of the peninsula is DLNR. We do have a clause in our enacting legislation that says that um, priority is to be given to those of Hawaiian ancestry for employment at the national park. And basically what that means is I get paid to take care of my kuleana. How amazing is that? Right. Um, and so good, you know, if you, we get groundskeepers, we've got archeologists and marine biologists and, you know, I mean, when you think about Molokai as far as like professional jobs available, there are very, very few, but this is something that um, our OPO can aspire to do because you think if you're going to be smart, it means you're going to live away. You have no job to come back to on Molokai, but I just want to put that shout out to our Kama'aina that check out Kalau Papa. We have positions all the time that we would rather see someone who is vested in the local community and <clears throat> You know, because it is a difficult place to live. And so oftentimes those who come from outside, they don't stay very long. Um, mostly because of the rules that we have in place today. Like you need to be at least 16 to visit. Uh, you know, so you cannot have your ohana living there with you. Um, There's a very specific kind of person that can work and live in Kalaupapa. Anyways, I can talk to her about that later. Mm -hmm. um, but um, now, so I, I gave you a ton of uh, information, and this is just so you can have continued discussions with your ohana afterwards. Um, what are those parallels between Hansen's disease and COVID-19? And, you know, how did our kupuna react and, you know, the challenges they faced? And what are some that maybe you have had? Um, today, our, we have, so we still have former patients living in Kalaupapa. Um, there's nine of them that call live there full time. Right now we have five in settlement and four are in hospital here. And so their safety and wellness is our priority. And so we malama everything around them, their whole community, everything from utilities, waste management, um, you know, safety. But the thing is like one of our patients insists on trying to hug everybody. <laughs> And when you think about how she grew up not being able to touch people and then, you know, having that right and privilege restored um, and then to have it taken away again at this age is a really big question for us. So we're always like, no, you can't touch it, you know, like, and we're all like masking. <laughs> and, you know, but how do you do that about making her feel the PTSD of her childhood? and how she was treated and, um, you know, like the eha that that brings up. And it really is something that we have to address today, um, mm -hmm. continuing to move around in the community and make them feel like they're not abandoned and alone. Because if everybody just stayed home and stayed indoors, you know, nobody's driving around, it looks really ghost town, you know, and they felt, they've been feeling really lonely. And so we have them driving around. And so they do the drive-by parades, we stand in our yards, they go by, we wave, they talk, you know, they yell and talk story with us and we try to make them feel connected. Um, so what are some things maybe you're doing in your communities to malama your kupuna? And how do we explain to them, you know, that we still aloha them and share? Um, and so this is an event I wanted to share. It's called Leha Lia. And it was started by a group of students um, from UH Hilo who had come for their service learning project and made lay. And when they put lay out for their kupuna, they looked around and said, oh, we feel bad. We better make lay for everybody. And so it turned into this massive project of over 1,200 lay and these big 1,700 foot long lay lai that go around the big cemeteries, the mass graves. Um, and it's evolved over the years. Um, uh, but uh, Professor Carrie Ingalls um, teaches history of communicable diseases at UH Hilo, and she's brought uh, her students and they formed Hui, Makana, Hui Malama Makanalua and so we worked with the Kalaupapa community and then we've actually opened it up to other people and so we get all these lei um, sent in and then you know made on Molokai and then we go out and after some protocol and some hule and you know some speeches we go and aloha each kupuna that wanted to be remembered so of the 8,000 patients that were sent there now you got to imagine some of them were brought in the 18 60s, 1870s, in their old age. So they was born when Kamehameha Ekahi was still the Mo'i. You know, like their traditions are very different than that of the Christian influence. So they, their mana'o is, yeah, the Iwi go back to the Kula Iwi. 
um, you hide or you you know you know tell everybody where you bury people. Yeah, like the mana is sacred and the mana belongs to the Aina. You give it back. You took it from it and you're gonna give it back. And so um, we see this transition of individual markers and wanting to be commemorated individually. But the um, the big tsunami, the April Fool's tsunami, went wipe out. Um, a lot of the markers, so the ones that remain are really the sturdy, hardy ones. We've had a lot of wooden ones that have just deteriorated over time. So anyways, what I'm saying is not everybody has a marker that had one once upon a time, and I know that's something that people struggle with because they want to know exactly where people are buried so that they can come and aloha them. And we try our best to find that information and facilitate, but really, um, I have a mana'o for all of us. Mm -hmm. What if we took time to remember our kupuna in the places that they came from? The ma'i ho'oka'avale and the effects of the separation be redeemed and be made pono again by reconnecting these people in the communities that they came from and being recognized and honored for their sacrifice of keeping the rest of your, the community safe. And especially this year instead of coming to Kalau Papa June 30th um, we're not able to have this event and so I'm proposing this virtual event well a, a different idea and this is something that even when we resume coming to Kalau Papa, everybody should do this June 30th go look for one kupuna um, if you have a relative find a picture write their name on a really nice card do an art project with your kiki um, if you don't know it I have some suggestions you go to read up on and Pick some kupuna or just say in general, mahalo to the kupuna who made the sacrifice. And set up a little memorial in your own home or in your yard or in your community, someplace on a bulletin board in, you know, at the store. I don't know, find a spot and say mahalo. And you can make a lay. You can um, write them a note. And if you know the words, I'm going to tell you, look up this song, Enakini. Um, Enakini is credited to um, our dear friend Anwe Nuez uh, Punua's papa, um, as well as John Punua, as well as um, another man named Ernest Kala, and he lived in Kalau Papa. And I, I suspect the two of them went meet up, they went Hakuri's song, and then they went their own separate ways and then started singing it in their own communities, and then they both get credit. Um, but Enakini, if you look at the words, it's calling on all the Lahui, everybody to rise up and basically restore the freedoms that were taken away from them now that they were cured. That was what, that was their anthem that their liberties be restored. So get up and sing Enakini on the top of your lungs on behalf of all the kupuna that have ever made a sacrifice so that our generation can thrive now. Um, I'm gonna, so if you follow us, you can follow us on Facebook um, and you can, and kind of, kind of, we're gonna figure out a way to continue to provide information for you. But what we're hoping to do is to make a virtual um, sort of memorial and exhibit. I want people to be able to take pictures or share video of the, their creations and the way they've honored and memorialized the kupuna in their homes and their spaces and upload it so that we can have like this virtual uh, lehalia from across the, across the world, wherever you are, you are invited to participate. Um, if you want more information, because we're like at the very ends right now, but um, I just got to throw these up, uh, check these out. Uh, John Clark wrote a great book on place names. He, get, he went through all the Kanika and Nupepa. And um, if you're into that kind of stuff, I love reading that book. This um, other book, Kalau Papa, Collective Memory, very extensive, beautiful, historical reference book of pretty much everything Kalau Papa. Ma'i Lepera, um, Lepera from Kerry Ingalls talks specifically about the disease. And then these are other great books. I love My Name is Makia. Read it. My son has done it, I think, like fourth grade book report. Like really easy reading. He, he talked real pigeon, you know, and, but he talks, he writes from the perspective of a child and what he was thinking as a kid. And then, and then he grows up. And so you can follow his writing style. Um, it's really fun. Um, Olivia, she's the first um, and only, I, I think, for um, autobiography. So she tells her own story. Um, and then Uncle Henry, Nalaielua, beautiful. And then this last book on the side, um, which I, um, 
that book has a series of interviews. So you get all of first-hand mo'olelo of, of different kupuna. I encourage you find that book, pick a, pick a page, pick a person, have your ohana read it, and then you have your kiki write a letter back to that kupuna. What would you say to them if this, you heard this story? How could you encourage them, lift their spirits, or, you know, kind of, I mean, really amazing and unique mo'olelo. Oh my gosh, one hour goes by so fast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, mahalo nui. Um, I am seeing a lot of really great comments and a few questions here. So maybe uh, we'll just go maybe another two more minutes or so. Um, for example, one earlier when you talked about kokua and that uh, ivahi poi nau slide, um, someone had asked at that point, did anyone from the neighboring northern ahupua'a offer kokua absolutely so the people of waikolo at the time there were 11 families living there there were eight in pelekunu my family is one of them and they were trying to provide as much ai as they could but you know they kept growing and growing and growing and then you know imagine that when you know that's just our nature yeah like feed them feed them i get feed them feed them until you know more and then you got to really make that hard choice that's why plenty of families left because that hooky and they're not out to be so close and yet be helpless. Yeah. And then what, what about their keiki? They, they should be pro afforded opportunities in life. And so a lot of them eventually move out, but yes, a lot of the, that critical support came from the Ohana from those valleys. I saw another question um, about volunteer opportunities and maybe not right now, but you know, when things start to open up again, yes. Um, so um, www.nps.gov slash K-A-L-A, Kala. Um, you go onto our website and there's a little tab for volunteering. Um, it basically gives you my email address because so, I run that program. But we do um, have internships normally um, and people come down with groups or as individuals to help with our natural resource management um, in our archives, our museum, um, our plant nursery, monk seal count, bird counts, we've got coral, uh, <laughs> we've got all kinds of things to count and measure. And so, yes, absolutely, check us out. My kai loa. So, you know, I, I also see a final question here about being recorded. And yes, all of our Lei Anue Anue sessions are being recorded, um, where you can either visit the Kadayo Kana Facebook page. Um, and I actually... I, in my closing slides here, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the schedules and how to get all the recordings. But before I bring that up, Miki, mahalo nui. Um, there's so many great thoughts and, um, you know, just ideas. A lot of people are even saying, hey, ikui lei kako, you know, June yes. 30th. And a great, great way to, um, great way to honor our kupuna. Um, and, you know, just our loved ones, whether they're here with us and we give them a lay now, which I also encourage, or yes. if you're, you know, going to go visit the um, Ho'oilina, then you can bring lay over there too. Yes. Go out and thank someone for a sacrifice they've made so that you could live. And really, there's not a Hawaiian alive today that is not related to the 8,000 people. And mm -hmm. so all of us are here today because of their sacrifice. Uh, mahalo nui. There's a lot of mahalos on both, both platforms and they're just really <laughs> thankful for um, all of this mo'olelo. So I'm going to bring up my closing slides here. Let's see. We saw this one already. Um, so in closing here, we always ask all of you to kokua and let us know how we can serve you better or if you want us to continue to serve you, if this is a benefit to you. Let us know um, at kanayokana.net slash survey. It just takes a few minutes. It's maybe six or seven questions. Um, some of them are like thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, so it, it's really quick. But it also helps us, you know, evaluate on a regular basis um, if, if Le Anue Anue is bringing value into your hale, and we hope it is. Um, I know I enjoy all of the different mo'olelo that are shared. And, you know, it continues to, like, spark different thoughts and memories of, of things we can do and ways we can reconnect and build, build community. 
Um, so here on the screen, you can see these are some of the graphics we, we use um, to just highlight what's coming up, you know, during that week. And so, you know, today we had Mickey. On Thursday, we're going to have two Limu practitioners from here on Kauai, uh, Lei, as well as Auntie Nalani, who will be talking about cooking with Limu. So I'm really excited to learn more about that. Um, and then on Friday, Uluvehi will be talking a little bit about Mo'olelo, um, Mo'olelo of Pueo here in Hawaii, but also globally. So really good topics. And then you can see our Aikole sessions are our Olelo Hawaii sessions that are hosted by Ekela Kaneopi Okrozier. And I know they got so many um, great speakers coming on here. Uh, stay connected with us. You know, the schedule can be found at kanayokana.net slash lay. And that's where you can find the schedule and all the links to our past recordings, um, how to go on to our YouTube channel, as well as our Vimeo channel. All of that is um, all being documented there. Um, so again, mahalo nui loa e miki ala um, for sharing such great mo'olelo. <laughs> and mahalo nui to every single one of you for choosing to join us today, um, whether you're on Zoom or Facebook, and you know, stay connected with us. Um, you can follow us both Kanayo Kana as well as Hawaii Nui Akea on our Facebook platform, as well as Instagram, and follow us so that you can get our updates, you know, on, on what's coming up next. Besides, um, and along with again, a big mahalo to all of our partners who also allow us to cross post on their platforms. Um, so finally, yeah, again, um, have a beautiful week, everyone. Um, honor our, our kupuna in, in every way, honor our loved ones, and just share your aloha with um, those in your community. Hi, aloha. Uh, we hope.